Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> um, until recently, I had never spoke in front of people, maybe my family um, and my kitchen staff. But uh, of late, I've been asked to do this quite a bit. And the first few times, I just said, OK, I'm going to wing it. And I went out there, and I winged it until I said butthole on stage. <laughs> And then I decided that I would write something, prepare something that I read. Um, <laughs> and today I'm going to do like a hybrid kind of, um, I'm going to wing it and read it. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, as you see, oh, there I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> um, at, as you can see, I am a chef owner of a farm to table, farm to fork restaurant in Eastern North Carolina. Um, and that is such a buzzword. I've just learned that that's one of the things y'all have been talking about today, farm to table, farm to fork restaurants, and, or farm to fork eating. And sometimes when things become such a big buzzword, they lose all meaning, you know? It's like that it kind of loses its importance. But really, at the core of what it means for us is uh, purchasing food directly from a farmer and it really puts you in touch with your food source. Um, one of the reasons we chose to open this sort of establishment in Eastern North Carolina was in an effort to rebuild our economy. Eastern North Carolina, the Kinston area, was once uh, a rich agricultural, tradition, tra agricultural region that was flush with money from tobacco and the textile industry. And as both those industries left Eastern North Carolina, our economy clearly uh, suffered. So our hope, um, our long-term vision, was to help foster and develop small family farms in Eastern North Carolina, once again, based on sustainable proteins, produce, um, and niche products. So we've been open eight years, and you know we've been working on that all this time. Um, when I say small family farms that are based on these products, there's something very similar between what used to be a tobacco farm and a sustainable produce farm, for instance. A family could subsist on the income brought about by a tobacco farm that was 10 to 50 acres. That's a relatively small farm. A family could not subsist off, a, off the income brought about brought from a farm that's ba a 10 to 50 acre cotton, soybean, um, or corn farm. It, the, the numbers just don't make sense. So we feel that this is possible with these small family farms um, through proteins, produce, and um, cheeses. And that's something we've been working on, one of the overall goals of our, of our restaurant. The other thing that farm-to-table uh, restaurants and eating and shopping does is it brings you in touch with your food source. It takes you directly, um, it, it gets rid of that middleman. So you can talk to the farmer, you can have some sense of where your food came from, the type of person who grew it, and you can have a very tactile relationship with the food you're putting in your body. When we first moved back to Kinston, um, we chose the particular spot for our restaurant based on it being across from our community's farmer's market. And this was in the fall, uh, winter period of the year when the farmer's market was not open. So that year in April, when the farmer's market did open, Ben and I went down to do some shopping and we were horrified to learn that there were um, oranges and bananas and pineapples uh, being sold at our local farmer's market. And people were there buying them, you know, without questions because they assumed if it was at the market, at the farmer's market, it was being grown in their region. And that's completely ridiculous. So <laughs> it, it brought to my attention how separated we are as a society from our food source. Because if people who are shopping at a farmer's market believe that we raise bananas in eastern North Carolina, then what about the rest, the 99 remaining percent of the population that shops at Walmart? Um, so this is something that we've been, I've become very fixated on. And I believe that one of the biggest problems facing our nation today is the fact that when we're hungry, we go through the drive through get a double cheeseburger, fries, and soda, and eat it as we drive home. 
What that says to me are two major things. One is that we don't understand nutrition and the role it plays in our health. And two, and probably more, that's more disturbing, is that we do not value the act of eating. More often than not, we all eat as we do something else. We eat and we play on our phone. We eat and we watch television. We eat and we drive. Eating and feeding ourselves is this one singular human experience that we all share. And it's something that we just kind of toss away as something to be done while we do something else. So I feel as though, um, as much as we all love food, we need to place more emphasis on the act of eating and breaking bread and sharing food with one another. I don't know how we got here as a society, but it's kind of a bad place to be. Obviously, many of you are much closer to it than I am. You work with our state's youth. You see their eating habits, and you know many of them have no sense that the French fry they just slathered in ketchup came from a potato that was part of a root system of a plant that can only be successfully produced once a year. So I feel like if we don't want a society full of adults who think an acceptable meal is fried chicken, a biscuit, and sweet tea, or a Big Mac and fries, then we have to address food education in a larger fashion in our public schools. Our children have to learn about practical nutrition and food source in school because it's not a focus at home. Our youth have to understand that that biscuit is made out of flour that is, grown, that is ground from wheat, which is a grass and is integral to so many of the foods we put in our body. They need to, to grow a potato, see how many potatoes it takes to make a supersized order of fries, and they need to participate in the production and preparation of green things too because I believe that will make them more inclined to try them. That's what I'm, try I'm experimenting with as a mother right now. <laughs> when I find myself in conversations about f food questions nowadays, which is much more than I did in the past, the question is always posed to me about large farms versus small farms or GMOs versus no GMOs, um, organic versus non-organic. And those questions are all very important, absolutely. Um, but for me, I kind of have a, an interesting situation in that I did, I grew up on a hog farm, and I mean, on a tobacco farm in Eastern North Carolina that transitioned into a large scale hog farm. So for many people in my position as a uh, farm to table chef, these things would stand in opposition. But I don't think that that's necessarily the case because I think we as a society drive these demands. As long as we, as Americans, demand a big old piece of meat at the center of our plate or in the center of our bun and we don't want to pay very much for it, then there's always going to be a place for large farms, large factory farms, and commodity products. That's just the way it is. So I would like to pose the question and talk about the importance of placing more value on food food preparation, the people who prepare it, and the people who grow it. And most importantly, I think we need to place more emphasis on the act of eating. And that's the end of what I have to say. Uh, <laughs> um, but I would love to answer any questions that you have, because I, I think I'm better at that. Yes. Um, I have not designed any programs to help me implement that idea, but I did participate in something that I thought was very, uh, very powerful and um, very hands-on, and it was, it was uh, implemented by the Food Corps, and it took place outside of Greensboro, and they took several um, classrooms of young folks, third through fifth graders, to a farm and they saw how the farm worked, and then we did little demonstrations teaching them about eating vegetables. Um, we prepared a salad together. I showed them the very basic act of grating carrots, and it was very, all the children were very engaged. They ate the salad, I think, largely because they prepared it, um, and because we were all watching, maybe. Uh, but I think hands-on, 
um, activities that really get people involved in their food preparation and the understanding of where their, their food comes from is something that will make children more interested in eating fruits and vegetables. Hi, how are you? Are you at all involved in the Healthy Schools Initiative um, that's going on? Um, I am not. I, I, I would love to be okay. um, in all of my spare time. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but look it up. It's the Healthy Schools Initiative. I actually won a bronze medal for our school in Charlotte at Ranson IB Middle School. Um, I won a, a, a bronze medal a year and a half ago. Um, for our Healthy Schools Initiative, so you're right, you're barking up the right alley. Oh, uh, good, good. Can we bring it to Eastern North Carolina? Can I bring it? Yes. No, it's, um, well, it's, um, President Clinton is involved in it and things like that, so that's his initiative. I'll be glad to forward you some information. Please, please. Okay, I need your email address. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes. To other parts of the state. Do I see, um, from a marketing standpoint, do I see an interest in organic and non-GMO products in Eastern North Carolina versus other parts of the state? Um, I think that Eastern North Carolina is behind the curve as far as that's concerned, absolutely. Um, and our restaurant, uh, we, you know, we promote and serve uh, things that are grown by small farmers, which typically means non-GMO organic produce and proteins, not necessarily uh, certified organic, but certainly grown with organic principles in mind. And we attract people from outside our region. Um, or we attract people who come to eat in our restaurant because the food is good. They don't care about uh, they don't care about those terms necessarily. Um, they care they care about the food being good and tasting good, and the food is good because it's prepared from scratch, from raw from raw pr products. You know, I, I come from a community that has a culinary school um, that I can't hire anyone from because the curriculum there does not focus on preparing foods from scratch because there's not a market for those students to find jobs because the institutions and the businesses that they would be hired by do not prepare foods from scratch. So the school is just filling a need. Um, so I, I, I assume that it's not like that all over the state, but yes, I feel like Eastern North Carolina is behind the curve as far as those those buzzwords go. I have a, I'm actually from Western North Carolina, and so we're also a little bit behind the curve in some cases. Um, I try to practice uh, a lot of what you said, uh, and a lot of the feedback I get from my students or their parents is, well, we just can't afford to eat like you do. We can't afford to do that because it's cheaper to go to Walmart. What would you? say I, I have something I say but I would like to I would be interested in in your response to that question that I get off of. Um, well I just don't think that's true that they can't that it's a, a, a an issue of money um, I do know that uh, I'm not talking about organic uh, produce or um, produce that you buy at Whole Foods I'm talking about the produce that or the proteins that you might buy at Walmart. Um, I think nutrition uh, against nutrition, something in a box versus something that's raw for your money is going to be a better value. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't buy that. I think it's that people don't know what to do with raw food. You know, they don't, they don't it's so much easier to open something up and put it in the microwave than it is to steam a piece of broccoli, although it's really not. 
Um, so I think it's more of an issue. People don't know what to do. It's, it's, our, it's our behavior. It's what we do as a society. It's the way we eat. That's what I'm talking about, placing more emphasis on the importance of how we eat, how we enjoy food. Does it always have to be something that's rushed? Does it always have to be something that's just a throwaway? You know, does it always have to be the easiest thing we do every day? Um, I think that's where the value is, is misplaced. How do you answer it? What is the, what is the um, you know, look at the big picture. Look at, you know, if one consistently eats at McDonald's every day or even, you know, three meals out of a week, uh, what what is one doing to one's body, you know, and and what are the long-term implications from a health standpoint and things like that? And the other thing yeah. is, I, what I try to emphasize is, well, what did your grandmother do? Right. Um, in in a lot of cases, the the students I'm dealing with are are quite poor, um, but their families figured out, you know, through the depression how to feed themselves uh, and became very independent and and relied on their own family farms. And so I simply point to that, and th that argument tends to resonate more with my students than any other, I would say. I think the other thing that I mentioned before that lends into this argument is the fact that we, as a society, think that we have to eat a big piece of meat at every meal. And those folks' grandparents that you're speaking about would have a small piece of meat seasoning a pot of greens. Um, and so until we begin to think like that again, it will always be challenging to have, to have the value in the meat that's in between the bun or the chop that's at the center of your plate because that is not historically how we have eaten. Um, so, yes. Yes. Um, when we opened eight years ago, uh, I put out feelers for local farmers that were willing to grow produce or proteins for me. And I had two bites. I had someone who was um, willing to grow some produce and someone who was already raising pastured proteins. Um, now we work with about 30 small farmers. And I, I turn away people um, all the time. I say I turn them away. I turn them toward other folks. Many of them sell proteins and produce here in the Triangle um, because it is a reality for, you know, more and more people are becoming interested in farming. It's cool again. Um, young people are going to school to farm and choosing to farm different things. So whether it's a product of our willingness to buy and foster relationships with farmers, it's probably not. It's more just the changing tide of things. But yes, I have seen a dramatic increase in the small family farm, young people turning to farming to make a living. Um, just three weeks ago, we had this young couple, I'd say they're in their mid to late 20s, come in and they've started a hydroponic lettuce and watercress business like six miles from our restaurant. That never in a million years would have happened or worked out eight years ago. Now they cannot keep up with the demand of their other customers, um, so I'm letting them sell all their lettuce and hydroponic watercress to other folks, although I'd really like to have it. Um, but I think it's more important for them to uh, branch out and have and reach as many markets as they can. Um, well, you know, I have not seen that Walmart is doing this. Are they? They do.
you know, I, I, I would love for Walmart to get on the local bandwagon, and I think it's just a matter of time before they do. But you know, a lot of people in our regions shop at Piggly Wiggly, and they do purchase a lot of local produce and proteins. Um, and they also uh, perpetuate the, the regional food traditions um, of Eastern North Carolina as far as um, lots of the pork products and things like that. So Piggly Wiggly, I think, with, for someone who's trying to shop on a budget and shop local, um, for someone in North Carolina, Piggly Wiggly is a, a great option. So Vivian is going to stay to mix and mingle with folks who would like to continue the conversation as we get the reception started. Please join me in thanking her. Thank you so much.